How about this? Welcome, everybody. I assume now you can hear the sound of my voice. If somebody would raise their hand in a salute of some sort or type something in, either of those would work for me. And people are typing in. Hi, Danny. How are you doing? Thank you all. And we even had a couple people who follow instructions who raised their hand. That always makes me feel good. Hi, Johnny. How are you doing today? And uh, so far, we're not at, not everybody shows up on time, right? You know, not everybody shows up. 80% of the business is just showing up. So we're all here. And so we're going to begin. Uh, I, why not? And there's a copy of the handout in the um, go to webinar control panel. I assume you all can access that. If you're having difficulty, I'm not going to stop during the presentation and go find a link and paste it in. Um, it should be there. If you send me an email, we'll send you a copy of the presentation. Um, but I assume all of you are able to get your hands on it. All right. So this is a two-part series. The first, what we're going to do today is we're going to be talking a bit about goal setting and setting meaningful goals. And one of the, I've, I've been doing this for a long time, um, maybe, I don't know, a long time, let's just say. And so one of the questions I often get asked by people is, can I be successful in real estate? What do I have to do to be successful in real estate? And you sort of go through a, well, a process. And the beginning of the process to being successful is the foundation. Now, just like the foundation of a house, if you mess that up, then the house isn't going to, you know, it isn't going to last. It's the a difficult part of building the house. It's an, it can be an expensive part of building the house. It's an important part of building the house. But once the house is built, you can't even see it anymore, right? Because it's the, the foundation. So one of the things that's going to be necessary for you to be able to reach your goals is to have a strong foundation. Now, I had a guy that um, was interested in joining my team. He chose not to because, because uh, another broker told him, this guy, by the way, was working at Safeway at the time, another broker told him that he wouldn't have to learn anything if he worked for that broker. And when the guy found out that I had 400 videos and videos on how to do everything, you have to watch all 400, but I had all these videos and the videos were now, he didn't want to learn anything, right? Now, my feeling is if that's, he should stay at Safeway, right? Maybe transfer to Trader Joe's, I don't know. But there's a lot of stuff to learn. You've got to learn how to use the MLS, how, how to use RPR. You need to learn where the forms are and how to fill them out and how to use zip forms. You're going to need to learn about escrows and preliminary title reports and closing statements. You're going to need to understand termite reports and property inspections and home warranties. And, and that's not all, right? That's not all. That's just getting warmed up, right? And one reason that agents fail is they won't do that first step. The other thing you have to do once you have the foundation is you have to create a pipeline. And a pipeline means you need to have people in a database of some sort that might be interested in buying, selling, or investing in real estate. And if you do that and you can concentrate on that, then you can get momentum. And once you have momentum, people are calling you, you're getting repeat business, it gets a bit easier. In order to expand from there, you're gonna need leverage, you're gonna need model systems, you're gonna need people, and then at the top of the pyramid, you're really good at it, right? Really good at it. Now, there are some basic truths. One of them is most real estate agents don't make it, right? I've seen all sorts of different statistics. Um, you know, according to the, the, the Department of Real Estate in California, somewhere about 40% of the people that need to renew their license just don't bother every year, about 40%, right? And I don't think it's because of early retirement that they made so much money they didn't have to work anymore. Most of the business is done by a small number of agents. You may have heard of the 80-20 rule. 
called Pareto's principle. It's that 80% of this produces 20% of that, and 20% of this produces 80% of that, that sort of a thing. So the old line was is that 20% of the real estate agents did 80% of the business. It's getting closer to 90-10, right? I've seen some statistics from the Associ California Association of Realtors. It wasn't, wasn't a scientific one. It was like a survey, but it looked like it was closer to 85% of the agents were making 15% of the money and 15% of the agents were making 80% of the money. And if you looked in your MLS as to where are all the sales and all that, you would see that there is a group of people that are doing very, very, very well. And there's a lot of people that are not doing so well. Such, you know, the, you know what the problem, the, the challenge with the 80-20 rule is? It's only accurate 80% of the time, right? 20% of the time, it doesn't apply at all. So why do agents fail? A lot of people get into real estate without really knowing what they're getting into. They are what are called an unconscious incompetent. They don't even know what they do not know, right? They don't even know what software they need to learn. They don't know. Many people think it's easy because they bought a house or sold a house and their perception of what the real estate agent did was not too much. And they're like, wow, that looked really easy. I could do that too. But here's a big one. And by the way, real estate is simple yeah but it is not easy right those are two different things many people do not understand it's a sales job right i used to ask i used to do this question where what really you know what what business are you in people would say real estate you know i'm a marketer i'm a what no, you're in sales and if i asked you this question if you weren't selling real estate what would you be selling instead a lot of people would look at me like what, what are you talking about Right, I wouldn't be doing it. I wouldn't be selling. I, is this sales? And sales is all about talking to people. The more people you talk to, the more you get paid. If you only talk to some people, you only get paid some. But if you talk to a lot of people, then you can get paid a lot. It's a sales job. Also, out of the back to the 80-20, many people focus on learning technical stuff. Now, 80% of the money you're going to make is going to come from not the technical stuff, but from the technique, knowing where to go, who to talk to, what to say, how to market yourself. That's 80% of the money. Now, that doesn't mean, don't, don't say, you know, Mike said that we only have to learn 20% of the contracts, right? Well, we only have to learn 20% of the, te of the technology of the MLS. That's not, you're going to have to learn all of that. I'm just saying that learning all of that isn't going to generate as much money as you might think, right? It's necessary, but the money comes from learning what to do. So why are agents not all making it? It has to do more than anything else with their willingness and ability to talk to people. I had a guy who, I mean, this has happened to me over the years where he wanted, he called me up and said, I want to come to your office every day and I want to watch you do real estate. That's what I want to do. I want to see it, right? And I, I told him that's not a thing, you know? And so he's now gone to another office. So his idea is that if he just goes there and he sits in the office, that he's going to absorb the real estate business somehow. And that somehow he's going to learn how to do it. That it's not going to, it doesn't work that way. Another agent that I hired, when she joined the group, her the first thing she did, she goes to a Zumba class. She got little pieces of cellophane and filled them up with candy and treats and things like that, tied a ribbon around it, punched holes in the corner of her business cards and stuck them in the ribbon, went to her Zumba class, told everybody, hey, I got my real estate license, I'm selling real estate, gave everybody a present. She's still in the business. She's still in the business. Right? You have to have a willingness and an ability to talk to people. It's all about conversations. Many people don't commit. Right? They figure, well, I'll try it for three months, six months, two months. I don't know. You know, um, you, you know the, the, the commitment means that you're willing to do what you need to do long enough to produce results. Right? And that's not three months. And it may not even be six months. Right, it takes time to get paid. There's something called the 90 day rule in real estate. And what that says, generally speaking, things I do today might have an effect in 90 days. 
right? I've had people say, well, I tried farming. I sent out postcards two weeks in a row and no one called me. So I stopped, right? Well, you didn't do it long enough. Geographic farming could take 18 months to start producing results. It's easy to get into real estate. That means it's easy to get out of real estate and it's optional. You're an independent contractor. You can do whatever you want. I'm, a, I'm being certified as a coach with EXP through what's called success coaching. I was a coach certified for Keller Williams and, and um, many people do not want to be coached, right? Because they're afraid, they want to do whatever they want to do when they do it and if they do it, but they don't really want to, they, they do not choose to be accountable, right? It's harder at first. Think of it like a, uh, an airplane taking off. You need a certain amount of forward, net forward thrust to get off the ground. But once you get to a certain height, you don't need as much power anymore to keep on going. And so we getting through that initial inertia into where we're into movement and acceleration eventually, and then into momentum, right? Where at some point you can, well, you can sort of glide. So unconsciously incompetent means you don't even know what you don't even know. Consciously incompetent means I know I don't know how to fill out a purchase contract. I know I don't know how to use the MLS. Consciously competent means that I can do it, but I got to have my notes necessary. I got to have the steps next to me. I've got to unconsciously competent is when you can just do it because you have repeated it and practiced it. And this is not just technology, what do you say, scripts, things like that, right? And I'm not a big believer in memorizing scripts, but knowing what to say. So you can just say it, right? When it, people talk to me, the words just come out of me because I've said them before again and again and again and again. I'm not thinking necessarily. Some of you could tell, right? So how to succeed, massive action, do everything. Right, particularly now that we're in a market that's going down, right? Right, we're in a down market. By the way, it's really good to get started and to start hard when the market is going down, when the market is down. Because if you get into real estate and you start working real estate when the market is hot, then what happens? The market's going to go down. And a lot of people are dropping out all renting. Right? They're not even bothering to get their license. The number of people, or it's, going, it's going down. But if you succeed when the market is down, then what happens is the market goes up again. And then the year ahead, by the way, I tracked the number of licenses that the state of California Department of Real Estate issues, and I've compared them to the sales in California as released by the California Association of Realtors. Why would I do this? Because I don't have a social life, right? That's why I do things like that. And there's about a two year differential. In other words, the market picks up, the number of agents picks up in about two years. Market goes down, the number of agents starts going down, right? There's a lag. Learning to do the things unsuccessful people don't like to do is the common denominator. Your goal, if you would like to have one for now, would be to do something in the next 30 days. And I know it's November and nobody wants to buy or sell a house. I just listed a house and I have written offers and gotten them accepted in Christmas Eve. I'm just saying, you know, it can be done. You have to pick the right group and you have to see yourself as in business for yourself, not by yourself. What agents are always saying to me, well, are you going to give me leads? You know, are you going to, you know, are you going to supply? See, sales is all about you getting clients. I'm just, I'm sorry to say this. Right, you understand if you were to narrow down what is the job of a salesperson, the job is to find clients. The job is to find clients. Right, you're saying that's the job. And if somebody gave you all the clients, then you don't really deserve to be paid a lot because the data entry parts and the filling out forms part and the going around like an Uber driver with a lockbox key, right? You're saying those are not the most valuable parts of being in real estate. The valuable part in, building, in being in real estate is developing your own client base. 
And I know an agent who always picks a group or a team because they promise her leads. She's been in real estate for decades and has no sustainable business of her own. No business, always dependent on other people. And um, it's not a good way to be, just, just my thoughts. All right, so why are you in real estate, right? Are you going to be, do you wanna be a big time agent, a full time agent? Are you a part-time agent that might want to become full-time or is this just a hobby, right? It can be an expensive hobby. And one of the things is to, and I'm, by the way, going to assume that everybody listening to me today is interested in being a big-time agent. Why not, right? Why not, right? If you're just a hobbyist, you don't really need to worry about plans and and goals and things like that. If something drops into your lap, yeah, yeah, you work on it, right? But if you're part-time and you wanna be full-time or you're full-time and you wanna be big-time, then this, this is for you. So what do we mean by a big year? It's about you having, thinking bigger, right? Having goals, making a plan. Our results are in direct relationship to our activities, our strategies, and how we, much we prioritize them. Real estate sales isn't something that just happens, right? The, the escrows just don't fall from the ceiling, right? You understand? It depends upon what you do. So we're going to talk about that. And at some point, you might want to have a team. I spent seven years at Keller Williams and much, much, much longer at a place called Century 21 and a little bit here, a little bit there. But I, since September of 2020, when I joined DXP, I did not bring a team with me. But I now have uh, what DXP calls a mega icon team with agents all the way from San Diego to Eureka, right? And I'm just saying at some point in your evolution, you need leverage, which means you need help. The team. If you don't know where you are going, you just might wind up someplace else. Right? You know, famous philosopher and baseball player from the old days, Yogi Bear, right? Which is sort of the, you know, do you got a plan? So you should start with a state self analysis. Right. Um, and a lot of times people don't want to do this. They say, I just want to, let's talk about the numbers. Is there a spreadsheet? Yeah, I got a spreadsheet coming. And you, if you're already in the business or just starting, you might want to take a look at where are you now, right? And where are you in different areas of your life? And there's the self-evaluation wheel and what's called the SWOT analysis. We're going to briefly talk about that. So what does success mean to you? Is it money? Is it fame and fortune? Is it reaching some particular aim, you wanna have investment properties, you wanna live a life of luxury. And one of the things that would help is that if you really thought about what would you be doing if you were successful in real estate that's different from what you're doing now, because motivation, you're gonna find this is true with buyers and sellers and investors. Motivation is one of the most important components. By the way, also true for real estate agents and their success. So what is a SWOT analysis? It's when you analyze your strengths, your weaknesses, opportunities, and any threats. We have a few threats these days. So a strength would be, do you have good market knowledge? Um, do you have a sphere of influence? Do you have any expertise? Are you connected in the community? If you're an agent that's been around, are there good reviews of you? If I Google searched you and read your Zillow reviews, would I want to hire you? Leverageable assets, which means that you could develop a team and you could do things with it because you know stuff. Industry reputation, brand identity, right? These would be strengths. Weaknesses would be you're a new agent or you, are, you have a team and your top producer or a brokerage and your top producer has left. If you're new to the market or the profession, if you have a small sphere of influence, if you lost money, don't have any money, if you've got bad reviews, negative identity, inefficiency, these are all weaknesses. Threats would be economic downturn predicted. Is that, are interest rates rising? Are there demographic shifts? 
Is your team leader still there? Is there a shift in the industry, the market, in inventory, in, in, in technological innovations? When our MLS upgraded from a really lousy software program to the one we have today, I knew at least five agents who retired. They retired because the multiple listing service was changing the software they were using and they didn't want to learn it again. I've had agents that I was trying to coach, trying, who use Microsoft Outlook and were struggling because a lot of the things that you can do with other programs, you can't do with Microsoft Outlook. And I tried to suggest maybe you might want to look at something else. And he said, I am not going to learn a new program. I will not learn. Right? Learning curve, no. They're going to have to pry Outlook from my cold, dead hands. Okay? All right. All right. Stay where you are. Opportunities. Is there growth in an industry, your company headquarters in the area, are there residents moving into your area, are there investment opportunities, new markets, new centers, new transportation, new buyer incentive, new investments, lower interest rates, not now, but they went down a little bit. And there are opportunities. So what are the things you might think about is what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, what are your opportunities and what are your threats? Because when we develop a plan later, um, which might be next week, um, a more specific, what are you going to do? We might want to you know, focus on some of those things. So goals, ah, now we're getting to the good stuff, right? What are yours? I don't know. So Forbes magazine reported a remarkable study about the Harvard MBA program. The Harvard graduates were asked if they had clear written goals. The results of the study was that only 3% of the students had written goals and plans um, and, uh, and, and plans to accomplish them. 13% had goals in their mind but hadn't written them anywhere and 84% had no goals at all. And what they found after 10 years, they interviewed the same group. The 13% who had goals but didn't write them down earned twice as much is the 84% that didn't have any goals, but the 3% who had written goals were earning on average 10 times as much as the other 97% combined. Um, people who don't write down their goals tend to fail easier than the ones who plan. So one of the reasons we do this, and when we get into the specifics of daily activities, this is going to be the next session, um, it serves us. It serves as a reminder of what we need to do, right? It's a way of bringing our vision into a reality, and it, you can track your process, progress, and filter opportunities. And you ought to have goals for business and financial and health and relationships and personal. And there's a wheel that's called the wheel of life, and the way this works. And if you, you know, you could use this, but there's, you know only a few hundred thousand of them on the internet, is that if you were to look at one of these, like health and fitness, where am I on health? I don't really wanna mention that, but let's say I'm a four or a five, right? And so I would block that out, right? Fun and recreation. Do you know what my biggest problem as a real estate person has been when people say to me, so what do you do for fun? You know, and I look at them like, you know, the way a cow watches, you know, a train or car go by. You know, I don't know, right? You know, and then what about love? What about that? What about family? What about, in, you know, and I knew a guy in a company that I used to work with. He at one point was like the number three agent in a in nationally in a very big company, very big company. Um, ended up divorced four times, bankrupt, and just sort of, uh, you know, I'm not a pleasant person, right? I guess for in the bank. Well, anyhow, so he had managed to sell real estate, but there was very few other things that were going well in his life. And what's the point? You know what I mean? So one of the things you might want to think about if you're in a business, which real estate is, you might have three pots of money. There's financing your lifestyle. Would you like to invest in real estate? Do you have any debts that you would need to pay off? And so let's say, as an example, 
when you analyze your lifestyle, you're like, well, I need a hundred thousand dollars just, you know, to go to the restaurants I like to, and just to live my life, right? That's what I need. Now, if you also, that would be one pot, right? So you want a hundred thousand dollars, but let's say you also would like to have an investment. You see, there may come a point where you either cannot or don't want to work anymore. And in most sales professions, when you stop selling, you stop making money. So if you were to be putting 20 to 40% of what you're going to need, so if you had a million, there's a general rule that you could get a 1% return on, on the gross value of an investment, right? And it varies on how you leverage it. I know that we're just, you know, talking now. So you might need a million dollars in investments in order to be getting a hundred thousand dollar return that would replace your lifestyle. Do you have debt? There, the IRS is going to take their cut, and so we might assume that fifty percent of your lifestyle might, you know, might 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 go for that. So that would mean you would need two and a half to three times your lifestyle. All right, in order to be putting aside money for investments and paying debts and everything like that. So you, if you wanted 100,000, 300,000 a year at $18,000 is a rough commission, you would need to sell about 17 homes. We're gonna fine tune this in a little bit. So what we're gonna be talking about is figuring out what your goals really are, writing them down and make sure they're specific enough and has deadlines within six months, I'm planning on doing this. And um, we're gonna write a three-step plan on how to achieve this. I have some samples, here is an example, but I have some more examples. My goal for the next 12 months is to earn pre-tax income of, that would be an example. My listing goal would be to take X number of listings. I Now, there's something called a lead indicator versus a lag indicator. So, a lead indicator is something that we would do that would produce the results and a lag indicator would be the results. So listings is a lag indicator because it's a result, but working an average of X hours a week, that's a lead indicator. You see, I can control that more than the number of listings or the number of dollars. And I'm going to work a certain number of days a week, and I'm going to take so many weekends off, and I'm going to take vacations, and I'm going to do so many warm hour, hours, so many hot and so many warm. You can say, what are those? Well, hot time is one-on-one -on -one with somebody that could say, yeah, I want to buy, or no, I don't. Showing properties, presenting offers, talking about price reduction canvassing past clients for referrals, for sale by owners, following up by phone, doing a listing presentation, expires, holding open houses, visiting unlisted builders, cold calling for leads, door knocking, prospecting for leads, all of those would be hot. Warm, which could re result in us getting paid would be the writing of the ads and going to meetings and polling expires and for sale by owners and previewing homes and attending other open houses to see what they're doing and going to events like this right updating your website preparing mailings all that kind of stuff now of the if we made a list of everything a real estate agent could do should do ought to do Right, we made that whole list, all the things you need to learn, everything, we made the list. 20% of the things that are on that list are going to result in 80% of your income. And one of the questions, and this is somewhat counterintuitive, because if you do two things and I do eight things, which of us is further ahead? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on which two you did and which eight I did because there's a difference between being busy and being productive. There are a lot of real estate agents that are busy all the time, but they're not making any money. So when you're doing something, a question to ask yourself, is this in my 20%? Is this in the hot area, right? The one, and by the way, in your calendar, you could put it in as green, right? All of those things, because it results in money. And one of the questions to ask yourself, does your schedule reflect your goals? 
And if you're doing something, is this your 20% or is it your 80%? So the plan, it's useful the nation, to look at what research we do have from um, our union. The National Association of Realtors has recently released their 2022 profile of home buyers and sellers, which means 2021, right? Because that's when they did the survey. So let's talk a little bit about buyers. What do buyers want from their real estate agent? Well, big surprise, about half of them want the agent to help them find the home to purchase. Now, one of the reasons I'm going through this is, is that when you're crafting your value proposition, right? When you're crafting, um, and yes, when you're crafting your value proposition, it might be a good idea to cover the things that buyers say they want. They want help with negotiation. Notice there's two different negotiation in paperwork and financing, that sort of stuff. <coughs> um, how did the buyer find their real estate agent? Ooh, here we go. Here we go. Right. This is going to help me focus on what I'm going to do. Now, notice there is somewhat of a difference between first time buyers and repeat buyers. But all buyers, 36, 38 percent of all buyers said when surveyed, they found their agent because they were referred to that agent by a friend, neighbor or relative. Thirty eight percent. You'll notice that's bigger than any two and almost any three put together. 12% had used the agent before, 10% viewed a property online, 9% I saw it on the internet but I don't really know where, 9% saw an open house sign, if you have listings you'll find buyers. I have a listing the day it was active, buyers were calling me, referred by another agent to 6%, Personal contact by agent, 5%, which is actually higher than it's traditionally been. 3% went to an open house, 2% walked into the office. I don't know about it. that's been a long time. Uh, relocation, you get the idea. How about social media? How about social media? I'm paying this company and they're posting social media stuff. Where is that? Saw the agent's social media page or crowd didn't even make it to 1%. Ew. How many agents did the typical buyer talk to before they ended up settling on one? 80% talked to one agent. 80%. You're the first one to talk to the buyer. Chances are pretty good. You're gonna, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna work with them. Um, what was the most important factors when they were picking an agent? Is it the company they worked with? No, no, that's actually, you know, like at the bottom, almost of the pile. Um, experience, uh, an honest and trustworthy reputation, good listener, family, friend, or is a friend, a friend, knowledge of the neighborhood. Those are all of the things. What are they looking for? Honesty, responsiveness, knowledge, knowledge of the market. One thing you could do if you're not a big producer to stand out and compete with people that are doing that have been in the business longer than you is to know the market. Um, did they use a buyer representation agreement? 35% said yes. 18% said yeah, but it was verbal. No was 34%. Don't know. I don't know. Did we? I don't know. I don't know. Would they use the real estate agent again? 76% said yes, they would recommend the agent, use the agent again, but 38% of the buyers never referred the, the agent to anybody. We might be able to do something about this, right, by having a better follow-up. Um, how about sellers? I want listings. How do you find agents if you're a seller? 36% referral, friend, neighbor, or relative. 27% yeah. had used the agent before. So one way to get listings is to sell buyers homes and do a good job and follow up. And then when they sell, you can list it. Personal contact by agent, 5%. Referral is 5%, website is 
95% are not from personal contact. Direct mail, 3%. You get an idea. How many agents does the seller talk to on average before they you know, pick one? 80% talk to one agent, 80%. Again, you're the first one to talk to them. They don't like talking to agents. You understand? It's like going to see a doctor and having a physical. You don't want to run and go see another doctor the same day and have another one, right? None of it was done right at this. Um, many of them use the same agent that they had used before. 40% of the sellers had used the agent before. And of course, the further away the, 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 the next purchase was, that percentage goes down. So selling and buying, buying and selling, you know, if they sell and they buy, almost 40% of all the sellers use the agent who listed their home to buy a home. Just thought I would share that with you. What do they want? Help pricing the home, help marketing the home, help selling the home in a specific time frame, right? Figuring out ways to fix up the home, to sell it for more. I'm going to be inviting a partner of EXP called Curvio, which is a concierge program that, for, um, that, that we've got, where they will help the seller fix up the home and build them on when escrow closes, right? These are all things that you might want to think about. What are the important factors in choosing the agent? Honesty, reputation, friend or family member comes up again. Agent's knowledge of the neighborhood is there. Um, would you use the agent again? 73% said, definitely, I love the guy, he did a great job. And yet 36% of them never referred or recommended to anybody. Right? And again, there's an opportunity here if we do a good job to follow up and to you know, help them. Um, get a record, record, get a referral. Um, when it comes, and we're starting now to get into, okay, what am I going to do? One of the things that would be that I would recommend that you do is to take what's called a disc profile. Tony Robbins has a free one that looks which is nice. And depending upon whether or not you're a high D or a high I or a high C or a high S. There are certain types of lead generation activities that might fit. Now, I have a whole class pretty much on this, but the four types of real estate agents are generally prospectors, networkers. Remember, networking came up really high. Converter, that means internet lead generators and marketers, right? And I have on my YouTube channel a video called Cold Calling is for Amateurs where I go into this in greater detail, we're going to get into specific things on Thursday, I think it is, that you could do and put into your plan. So you need to meet more people. One of the questions I like to ask agents is, are you doing this full-time or part-time? Right, and they go, oh, I don't know. So how about, well, if, 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 you, if you don't have a bunch of escrows right now, would it be maybe a good idea to spend 80% of your available time looking for clients? How about that, right? 80% of your time. Now, 40 hours a week, some of you are thinking, well, you know, I didn't get into real estate to work 40 hours a week, right? You know, I could have done that at, you know, at, my, at, at a job. So let's talk about 20 hours a week, right? That's all we're asking, right? That you devote 20 hours a week you know, really devoted to real estate. Now, if you spent 80% of that 20 hours looking for clients, and then you divided that, let's say over five days, that comes out to 3.2 hours a day. Three hours a day. Three hours rounded down is an 80% focus of a 20 hour work week spread out over five days. How many hours a day do you spend prospecting for new clients? Just thought I would ask that. Um, let's say you're gonna make 10 contacts a day and you're gonna do it five days a week and you did it 50 weeks a year, All right? Taking two weeks off at least, right? Well, 50 per week times 50 weeks is 2,500 people that you would have contacted. 
divided by 15 years, I mean, depending on where you are, people sell every 10 years, maybe every 15 years, that's still 166 transactions. If people sell on an average of once every 15 years, if you got even one out of 10 of those, that would be 16 transactions. And that's not even including the people they might refer to you. So where are you now? And one of the things that I would recommend that you do is to ask yourself, how many people do I have in my database? And if your answer is, what's a database? Well, I got videos on that, right? I got videos on that. But you, you, that would be a good starting point. Let's say, for example, you have 100 people in your database. Now, if you're going to get a 10% return from your database, this could be a goal. I've got some other numbers coming up. And do you want to grow it by 250 over the next 12 months? Let's just use that as an example. So this is called a gap analysis. You want, let's say your goal, and these numbers aren't matching, but I don't know, it's just a goal. Let's say your goal is 500 people in your database. By the way, when you get to 500 or 600, things really start to happen. And you currently have 100. That means you need 400 more. And if you divided that by 12, it means that you're going to need to add an average of 34 people every month. Now I have a spreadsheet coming up, which I'm going to share with you, which it, it does some of the math, but we're going to get there. Other classes, I talk about what do you do when you have a database? By You have to organize it, you have to feed it, which means you have to keep putting people into it, you have to communicate. In a systematic way, what would that look like? Well, maybe you have a newsletter you send every month, holiday greetings, you meet with people to have coffee every 90 days, you call people that are in your database, and you daily reach out to people on social media. That would be systematic. Now, um, there was actually more I, I thought I had in here, but let me, um, I'm going to share something in the chat. Hopefully this is, is this what I wanted to share? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that's not it. Here, let me, um, I'm going to share something that, um, okay. All right. And this is a Google sheet. Those of you that are in my program, which means you're, you know, where are we? Is that it? Did that actually share? I don't think so. I don't think so. Ah, uh, there we go. How about that? Can you see that? Now, don't click on this and say, hey, Mike, I want to have editing privileges, because I'm not going to give them to you, because then you'll mess up my spreadsheet. What you do is you make a copy of it, right? Does everybody get that? You go to file and you make a copy of it because I'm not letting you mess with my spreadsheet. But let's take a look for those of you that are geeks, right? Need to geek. Here we go, right? So what the spreadsheet does, and I'm recording this, and if you're in my group, you know, I'd be willing to talk to you one-on-one -on -one about how to do this, but you're gonna have to think in advance. It starts with what is your desired income? Now, remember in our pot thing, the three pots, not that other kind of pot. In those three pots, we wanted $300,000 a year so we could live on 100,000, we could pay our debts off, and we would have money to invest. Now, our next question is, does your broker have a company dollar cap? And if you're asking yourself, what's that? Then you might want to talk to me about eXp. Because at eXp, we have a $16,000 cap. And I'll show you what that means as we go along. So one of the things you might think about is in my business, what percent, what if I'm not in your group, can I still talk to you? Maybe, only only if you talk nice, All right? Try, you can talk to me. I'm, um, I, I, I have a large team. I spend most of my coaching time with members of my team, um, although I can be bought, right? We can talk. So what percentage of your business is going to be listings and what percent is going to be buyers? 
as a general proposition, it would be good that 60% of your business actually came from listings. You have to list to last in real estate, but you can change this, right? If you said, well, I don't really feel comfortable with, I want 40% to be and 60% buyers, fine, you can change these numbers. So if your average, what is the average price of a home? Average list and average sale. Now, because the market was kind of, you know, I just used the same numbers. So what that if you want three hundred thousand dollars and sixty percent of it is buyers, that means one hundred and eighty thousand dollars is buyers. If the average sales price is a million dollars and the average commission is two and a half percent, then the gross commission is twenty five thousand dollars at exp, and you can change these numbers, right? If you're at a seventy thirty office, if you're on a sixty forty, you know. 50, right? Call me. But at EXP for a normal solo agent, it's an 80-20 split with a $16,000 cap. So that would be $5,000 from any one sale that would go to what's called the company dollar. And it calculates it for listing. So what would we need in order to reach our goal? Well, we're going to need five listings and seven buyers, right? Using that breakdown. Now, do your listings all close? Does every buyer actually buy? Does every seller actually sell? No, 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 it doesn't always happen. So this is just some numbers that I put in, but let's say that, because why wouldn't the buyer buy? Their financing wasn't any good, it didn't appraise. They found out that there were foundation issues, whatever. What is the dropout rate? And by the way, in a particular market, depending upon which MLS software you have, you can find out what the percentage is of transactions that fell through. You can find that out. What percent actually close of listings, right? It used to be a, over 100%, it seemed like. But I lowered that by 15% just because, you know, the market isn't as robust as it was. So if that's what our percentage is, we're going to need to find 10 buyers and six sellers because they're not all going to close. And that means we're doing less than one buyer a month and one seller every other month. Now the question is, and these numbers are going to appear on the page two of this, is how many appointments am I going to need to actually get a buyer to work with me or a seller to work with me? Say one of the metrics you should be always looking at is how many appointments are you having? And let's say you need four appointments. Well, in this case, the percent, I'm, I'm, I'm doing 75, right? Um, why not, right? But it, it, it could be higher than that. It could be lower than that. If you're a brand new agent, it might be 25% at the beginning, unless somebody's helping you. If you're experienced, it's 80 or 90, because it also depends. But what this is doing, given our percentage of close rate, it's going to calculate how many appointments we need. So we need a little more than one appointment a month for buyers and a, a little more than one half of an appointment for sellers, which would give us a total of 12 units. And at a million dollars each, my team's average is 1.2, but we sell some that are way more expensive and some that less. So that would produce 300,000 in gross commission income. Now, what I've also done is I've given you a chance to look at what your expenses might be. Ooh. Now, the way I've done this, and I'm not, you know, um, I'm not the best, let's say, at, at Excel. I might be better than some of you, but what I've done is I've taken all of the numbers and the monthly is calculated from the yearly. So for example, if you know you're spending $30 a month on your Supra key, you would multiply that times 12 and add that in, right? So my dues, and I throw in the Supra key usually in that are about $700 a year, being a member of the union which roughly is $58.33 a month. 
MLS, if you pay in one lump sum, is about $845 or $70 a month. Equipment would be, um, I bought a new cell phone, yeah, right? You know, I've got uh, um, Pixel Buds, you know, I'm, I'm buying a new Chromebook or well, you get the idea. Now, office fees, broker fees at eXp, we pay $85 a month. There's no additional fees, which means on an annual basis, it's 1,020 a year. We don't have desk fees or office rent, but some, if you're a team, I actually do rent some space. Not enough for you to come and sit and watch me. It wouldn't be that useful, but you might, you could plug that in. Lead generation is how much money are you willing to spend or do you have to spend on marketing materials, on farming, on whatever? Is it $100 a month? Is it $200 a month? Is it zero? What is it? Can you still sell real estate if the, answer, the number is zero? The answer is yes. And by the way, if it's zero, you have to put in zero. Otherwise, it'll, you'll get an error message, right? But I put in $100 a month. Um, auto insurance, right? If this is a business, right? I pay, that's roughly what I pay. Technology, what I mean by that is all the little subscriptions. You know, I subscribe to Folio, I subscribe to Disclosures IO. These are all things that start dinging you, you know, $15, $28, you know, that sort of stuff. You gotta watch those things, right? You gotta watch those, but maybe you're doing $100 a month. I actually do have a full-time assistant which is the only reason I have time to do anything like this without going crazy. But given those expenses, and by the way, many real estate agents tell me it's $500 a month is what it averages. Mine's a little heavier, $6,885 a year. Notice if we go back to our form over here, this gets added in. So if our gross income is $300,000, our cap is 16,000. It means if you're at eXp, your income before expenses would be 284,000. If you're at eXp, it's really easy to calculate your net commissions. Take your gross and subtract 16. Yeah, because that's the cap. So that's 284 when we subtract the operating expenses, we end up with $277,115. Isn't that fun? Wasn't that fun? All right, now, for those of you who like this sort of thing, if you click on the second, and the third one is what we're going to be talking about next week, this is, SOI is people that you know. It's your sphere of influence. So this takes the number from the previous spreadsheet, 12. So one question is, of the people you know, also referred to as your sphere of influence, how many people do you need in your sphere of influence in order to make a sale? Now, some studies have been done on this. Brian Buffini and Joe Stumpf are people that have referral-only programs. And what we find, and other companies that I worked with in the past who really looked into this, is, is that your return on a sphere of influence can be anywhere from five to 10%. It could be higher than 10, but five to 10%, depending on what you do. Do you have a systematic way of, of following up with them? Do you ca call them? Do you have lunch with them? You know, it, it depends. But if you're getting a 5% return, and that doesn't mean that 5% of the people are buying or selling real estate every year from you. It means they might refer people or buy or sell themselves. You need 20 people at 5% return in order to get one sale, or you would need 240 people in your database. If these are people you don't know, you might need to talk to 100 people. Back in the old days, we would say 50 but you might need to talk to 100 people you don't know before you actually sell anybody a house. So if all of your business was coming from people you don't know, you would need to go meet 1,200 people, which by the way, when you do the division, well, we're gonna look at that, right? So now you might be saying, well, I'm not, I wanna do a little of both. I, there's people I know and there's people I don't know. So, okay of what percentage of your business are you likely to get from the people you already know? Let's say it's 60%. Now, remember our goal from over on the other page was seven, I believe. 
Isn't that true? Seven, see that? Yeah, seven. See, I obviously I have no social life, right? Because I have time to do stuff like this. But let's say we want seven from our sphere of influence and we need 20 people to get seven, we need 144 people. And if we want 40% of our business to come from the people we do not know, don't knows, I should probably get rid of that S. Why don't I, it'll, it'll bother me, don't know. All right, um, then we would, and our goal is five and we need a hundred in order to get to one, we're gonna need another 480 people. We don't know, or a total of 624. And remember our current numbers, and this is something you're gonna to have to type in, but remember the example I had was 100, right? But you're gonna to need to add a bunch of people, right? 524, okay. So how many do we need to add? Roughly 44 per month or 11 a week, or two a day, two a day? If you added two people a day, five days a week, that'd be 10 a week times four weeks would be 40 people a month times 12 months. Um, you'd be, that's 480 people. You'd be selling some real estate. Two, see how far we've gone. We're, we're down to just two people a day. Could you talk to, could, could you do that in 30 minutes maybe? 30 minutes, we have 30 minutes, two people, two, that's all we want. Now, many real estate agents, because I talked to a lot of real estate agents, how many people did you add to your database last week? So, uh, what's a database? None, zero, right? So this, you know, this is something you can play with, but what it gives you, what we want to do is to break this down to some sort of a daily activity. That's what we're gonna talk about next week. We're also gonna talk about who would we talk to in order to start you know, pushing people into this? Who would we, and what would we say? We're gonna talk about that, not next week, next, the next time I do this. That's what we're gonna to talk to, talk about. And if you had the activities and you knew what you were going to say and you had them in your time blocked in your, uh, calendar and you planned your work and you worked your plan and you had somebody to talk to when you were having difficulty, all that sort of stuff, ah, it just might work. It just might work. All right. So this was part one. You got a bonus spreadsheet. Isn't that, wasn't that cool? There are a lot of, you know, how to calculate kind of things, you know, this one's maybe got more 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 of it than, than than you know but but you get an idea right i'll tell you something you want to make a lot of money if you talked to 10 people a day right now just because you talk to them doesn't mean you're adding them to your database right you're saying we, we need to add people to if you talk to 10 people a day or 20 people a day like 20 people a day you could easily do in three hours and three hours is 80 percent of 20 hour a work week if you spent three hours a day and you talk to 20 people, right? And could you be adding two to three to four people every day to your database? And the answer is yes. And when you multiply that out over time uh, and you follow up, uh, you do some serious business. All right, um, any questions other than those that have already been asked that I am ignoring? Uh, Soledad wants to know what she could do. If she's not in my group. Obviously, she should talk to me about joining her group. Roger, if you have a question, did you want to speak? You could speak. Or did you just want to wave? I don't know. And uh, let me just see. What about and I'm nice. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Cool. All right. Well, I'm assuming that I've satisfied you for today. Next time we meet, we're going to go into some of the specifics. It'll be fun. Talk to you all later. Have a great day. Be safe out there. Bye-bye.